Yo, welcome back everybody to another episode of The Shuffle Pod. We got another super special guest on today's episode. We got Pablo Mesa Tablemon himself. What's up? Hey, thank you so much for having me. Yo, thanks for uh, being on. Yeah, Pablo, obviously one of the biggest content creators, has a pretty good career in the Pokemon TCG and is one of the best players. And we thought it would be awesome to get him on the podcast. And uh, we got some questions we want to ask, of course, like his content creation journey. Maybe ask him a little bit about how Arlington went, because I know you read Arlington. I saw you played a Lost Zone deck, right? So, I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be pretty cool to kind of talk about that, kind of run us down, I guess, your, your list and stuff. And, uh, we will also probably talk maybe a bit about your casting gig you did with LEIC. So that was pretty awesome to see. So definitely looking forward to this one. Before we do get in the episode, of course, we got to do our weekly recap. So uh, Lindsay, how has your week been? Oh boy, have I had a week? I've had, I've had, <laughs> I've had a week. It's been for those who follow me on Twitter. You know, it's been it's been a very emotionally exhausting week for me, um, to say the least. As much as I love my job, it. it it has its hard moments, and I did have a few of those hard moments this week. But, you know, end of the day, it's still an absolute dream job. So I'm still happy, still loving it. Um, we didn't get to find out who won the gingerbread contest yet. Really? Um, the thing, like, we won, right? Like, my department won. I told you guys about how awesome this gingerbread house was. Like, it's really not even a competition, but, like, I just want our free lunch already. That's really all I want mm-hmm. is our free lunch. <laughs> um what else did I do this week? Um, not, I, oh, oh, shinies. I caught shinies uh, in Pokemon Violet. So I've been grinding mm-hmm. Pokemon Violet. And the first shiny that I saw was Skip Bloom because it was in a, it was in like a little crowd with a bunch of jump loves. Or maybe mm-hmm. I had that backwards. But whichever, like the, all, it was a, all the pink ones around. And then there was a Skip Bloom, which is usually green, but it was pink. And I was like, that's a pink skip bloom. <laughs> bloom. <laughs> so, so I did. I did catch my first shiny um, in Pokemon Violet. I was super excited about that. Um, something else I have for you guys as well is I have a friend, a friend named Bailey, who I met at Locals, um, plays Pokemon. She started making rugs. So mm-hmm. she makes Pokemon-themed rugs that are really, really cute. Like she has like this like... Um, whooper one like she has like the snorlax one for sale that's really really awesome she's making me a really cool gengar one so i'll have to show you guys when we get that but um yeah she's she's awesome she is selling these rugs so you can find her on twitter uh tough tuft dot bales so t u f t e d dot bales b a i l s so Go check her out. I think she's doing some commissions right now. So that'd be super yeah. awesome if you guys help out a homie, get yourself some cool stuff in the process. Um, but in terms of me and what I got this week, so these, again, these are actually were Christmas presents. Uh, Dylan got me these WonderCon limited edition diamond collection. Hmm. Flareon and Jolteon. So to match my Vaporeon. So I now have the three main evolutions of like the that this convention exclusive so i'm super excited for that that's what the diamond but means i've never seen the diamond once the diamond the diamond funkos are like sparkly so the co is it glittery this flare ends like glittery mm-hmm. and so there's my vaporeon one which i actually have like right here is just like this 2021 oops spring convention limited edition vaporeon but this one was from like the actual wonder con where there's like fewer of these um mm-hmm. but i think more people like vaporeon so the vaporeon yeah, one is like, like the least liked evolution i think <laughs> yeah um yeah, but it's not even i good love in the these TCG, i'm so. so excited i've been wanting these three in my collection and now i have them so i'm have really them. really excited about that um but yeah that is definitely it for me so what about you ldf yeah, so uh, my week's just been kind of kind of the norm. I've just been chilling, making content, still kind of recovering from my sickness a little bit. I haven't spent a lot of time with my friend, though, because unfortunately he's going through like a little breakup right now. So I spent a bit Aww. of time with him yesterday. Yeah, he's just been going through it. So I wanted to make sure he was good. Um, but other than that, not much has been really happening. Uh, but I can update my Funko collection because yesterday I did go on a little 
Funko shopping spree again. And Ooh. I copped a couple Funkos here. So first of all, I want to show off the big one I got. And this is actually B Rabbit uh, from 8 Mile. Now, if you don't know who that is, that is Eminem. Now, I am not the... I, I mean, I like Eminem. Uh, I personally don't listen to him much anymore. But I had to cop this. It's a really cool one because the licensing uh, issues with Funko and Eminem, they don't actually have like an actual like Eminem Funko. They can't say Eminem. So they found like a loophole and made a Funko off of the movie 8 Mile and then had <laughs> Eminem's the Eminem's like, I want commission. I want money. <laughs> yeah. Like this is probably why we haven't seen like a Drake one yet. And this is like an awesome Funko to have. And there's even rumors they might come out with an Eminem Funko, which is kind of why this one's kind of sought after right now so i wanted to get that and then i also got another uh, scooby-doo villain one we got spooky space kook here from <gasps> the original where are you episodes uh one of the most iconic and scary villains from that and i'm starting to collect the the scooby-doo ones now because i just got phantom shadow so i was like all right we got to get the spooky space kook one next because he is one of the best villains from the original run of scooby-doo you um, must have like an insane funko store near you because there's there's about, honestly, there's probably, like, six in my area. Like, in, like, an hour radius of where I live, there's probably at least, like, six big stores. Like, it's kind of insane. Wow. Yeah, and it, it kind of gets bad when me and my buddy just, like, go into them all the time and, like, the addiction's like, Ooh, should I should I buy one? It's, like, it, it gets problematic, but, you know, it's fun to collect them. I have way too many now. I think I'm going to be getting, like, a shelf for Christmas or something so I can put them. Because I'm pretty sure I'm literally, like, out of room now in my room for, like, these. So Yeah, you start building but, uh, shelves. Yeah, I'm going to have to start. Yeah, I have to like build a shelf or something to, to store them because I, I collect way too many different things and eventually my room is going to be like crowded. So I definitely got to make space for all that. But uh, that's basically how my week has been. But of course, Pablo, how has your week gone? I know you were at Arlington Regional. So why don't you kind of give us like a recap of all that? Yeah, so Arlington was uh, both really fun and really frustrating for me in terms of the tournament. Uh, but like speaking of uh, collections, I was uh, by pure chance, um, like I was in a room with uh, three of three other friends, uh, one of which I hadn't seen in a long time, and we were calling ourselves the Masters Plus Room because we were all over thirty, right? And we've mm -hmm. all been playing since two thousand and four, so like yeah. we're probably like uh, some of the I guess oldest standing players, uh, mm -hmm. which included Ross Cotton, Mike Fischer, and Sebastian Crema who uh, actually got top four at Worlds in 2004 yeah, as a senior, yeah. right? And so he ended up uh, selling one prize card of his collection to a very dedicated um, collector, and uh, which is not the usual, like, David person, which is usually the one that collects the Worlds cards or not. And, like, at one point, I was in a room, I want to say, with, like, $2 million worth of cards, like, the, yeah, the collector like brought out his stuff to showcase and to show us like he was gonna show sebastian because that's who he made the deal with but i ended up uh just arriving early to texas and i got to the room and i just happened to be there and <laughs> you're like, like oh my gosh <laughs> yeah at, at yeah. one point i was like hmm, i wonder if i'm actually safe in here <laughs> like it was a lot of cards and like so there was by getting that uh semi-finalist card this collector completed uh, one of each semifinalist card from every single world championship from 2004 to uh, 2019. And I believe he bought the 2022 one uh, over the weekend because uh, the vendors had it. So like that was like I I've barely seen some of those like myself physically mm -hmm. like at the events, uh, especially like the finalists are usually more showcased than semifinalists. And to see them all in the same room and then that's not to say like he had um, like a playset of semi-finalist tropical beaches from the same year, oh. yeah? and uh, finally uh, champion sorry uh, tropical beaches, and um, he had every single first edition card that exists so far, like just in a casually in a binder. So it was just like who damn. who is this guy? Hmm. Uh, so you can you can follow <laughs> him on on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, give me one second, and I'll tell you. I was definitely very. Uh, very surprised and that also prompted me to be like okay well i do have a um a semi-finalist very old card myself yeah the 2005 semi-finalist so i as soon as i got back to mexico i made sure to like i had it in like a a certain location that was not like super well protected or anything um 
I was definitely not aware how much it could possibly be worth. Yeah. Uh, so now this is definitely, I, like, I didn't think this was my most prized card in terms of monetary value. After this weekend, I am very conscious <laughs> of how much it's priced. Uh, so I definitely want to keep that safe. I don't know if I'll be selling it or not, but um, because it's like, I did sell my number three trainer card all mm. those years ago. Years ago yeah. So, and like, part of me sort of regrets it. Part of me also like, that's how I first was able to travel to, to like pay myself a uh, travel a trip to Europe uh, when I was like after high school that was my um, myself congratulations you made it <laughs> thing so like it was cool but like I can't help but wonder like with the prizes at what they are today like how much that card would actually be worth right yeah oh um, for sure like that definitely yeah. would be worth like a lot yeah <laughs> that, and yeah, so this collector cool. his Instagram is Jen Romy Meister. Yeah, and like the ah. last, the the latest mm -hmm. uh, reel he uploaded was exactly like showcasing his collection of all the semifinalists that he finally has uh, complete. I think he's still missing a few 2004 uh, mm -hmm. stamp promos, so that's what he's he's really on the hunt for. And then I know he's been lacking a few like uh, some international stamp, uh, like the ultra walls and the double colorless and stuff like that. Uh, but like all the also like I I don't know I felt like. All, all of those cards just like in the same room as I was like it felt like a, a, a little bit of a piece of history I guess uh, for mm -hmm. Pokemon like all those promos and like I I had seen some people win those cards you know like he could tell yeah. me yeah this card belongs to Michael Prama what's uh, finalist card was there from whenever he got second place so it was very very impressive to see. Really oh, yeah, that'd be, yeah, I that'd can be only really imagine. Crazy. Your week sounds so much cooler than ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that that that's how that's how my Arlington trip uh, started, and then um, the tournament went. It was going really well until I somehow managed to encounter two decks with Empoleon whilst playing Lost Box, <laughs> and they were only playing one. Ah. But I somehow managed to cut into their single Empoleon, like in the total of five games I played between mm -hmm. round eight and round nine. I caught into them starting their Empoleon in four out of those five games when they were playing 12 total basics, 11 others. So, like, I don't know. The the chance of that happening are astronomically Very low, slim. I imagine. That's really unlucky. So, like, that left me out of date to contention. And I was, like, losing both when it is definitely <laughs> left me very frustrated <laughs> over the weekend. Yeah. You know? No, yeah, that, that, that is annoying. Especially because Empoleon's, like, nobody really plays that anymore. You right. know, it's just, well, it's, you know, it yeah, just kind of adds just, to it. That's just like the 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 bad RNG, like the yeah. This is like a very rare instance. It just happened to happen to me this me. weekend. Weekend, yeah. But like, I like I understand them starting it once, right? Or them searching right. for it on turn one and retreating. But to four it. out yeah. of five is but kind of starting with it as their active Pokemon. Four, like back to back, to back, back yeah, to back, back. Like the round round date ended. I was like, okay. I have another round. I can't like my luck has to be different this round. Mm -hmm. And then I sit down and my opponent turns over and pull in again. Like <laughs> I, I was like, what? You're like it's looking under the table. You're like, you got another one? Yeah, like <laughs> Yeah, that's that's pretty unlucky for sure. Because yeah. like also like not only is Empoleon not seen play in like Palkia itself, but like the water, like the Palkia decks aren't even seen that much play right now right. anyway. It wasn't Palkia, it was Arceus, Espion, mm -hmm. Aerodactyl. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. And even that's yeah. like a deck, you know, that's not super popular. Spice, yeah. Very right. Spicy, but not. Yeah, just that's definitely yeah. some pretty bad luck right there for sure. Yeah. So that soured a little bit my my weekend because I'm very competitive and like I always yeah. set myself the goal of um, winning every tournament that I attend. Of course, that's very difficult. <laughs> um, but I feel like I was do a little better this time around. I prepare much better than. Toronto, since I cast it early, I see I had very little time, time in between yeah. um, events. And because I was casting, I did, I would say I was a little bit lax on my uh, hardcore preparation for an event, since I knew I didn't have to buy cards for LAIC or I didn't have to, um, uh, like, know every single intricacy of each matchup because I was casting and not playing. Exactly. Yeah, That's definitely true. a different type of preparation that exactly. I absolutely mm -hmm. have like a million jillion questions about because I'm super <laughs> interested into it. Um, however, first, we have a few little commercials. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you guys know the drill. Ask the pod. Feel free to send questions to so the chance of them being answered in next week's podcast. 
You can also send us suggestions, topic ideas you'd like to hear, recommend guests that you want to see. You can send them over to podcast at theshufflesquad.com. LDF, are you looking to get a great price on any and all Pokemon TCG products? Of course, I'm always doing that. I'm always looking to who, get who's, who's not always looking to do that? Because you can go to atlascollectibles.com. You can go to yeah. Atlas Collectibles and use code TSS12 to save 12. yourself 12% on your order. That's crazy. 12%. <laughs> and as well as ptcgostore.com, use code TSS5 to save yourself 5% on all your PTCGO codes. It directly helps support us at the Shuffle Squad. And our newest sponsor is your playmat. I'm actually in the process of designing a funny playmat. Hopefully, maybe I'll have it maybe in time by Knoxville. Um, you can do a custom play mat. You upload your own image. Uh, you can use code TSS5YP for your play mat to save yourself 5% on that order. So go check them out. I think we are at a good time for our Poka X word puzzle. Yeah, I think it is time for <clears throat> guest that Pokemon. I'm going to be providing the Pokemon for Pablo and Lindsay to work together to figure out what Pokemon it will be. B. So, you know, you know how to play the game, Pablo? Uh, I believe I read the rules, but I will be honest, it's the first time I'll, I'll be yeah. playing. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll I'll, we'll name a Pokemon right, and then you got to work together to kind of figure out what it is. And each time you get the question wrong, I will uh, provide you all with a hint. This first Pokemon, the first Pokemon we got here, we got a Pokemon from Generation number 1, and it is okay. going to start with seven letters. Seven so, letters. Letters. P I K A C H. Is it Pikachu? It is not <laughs> Pikachu. Oh. I'll I'll give like a, a mini hint on top of that. This might have been on your mind this weekend, pa or in Arlington, Pablo. Like it might have been on your mind. Mm. <gasps> as a play, or can I add like as a play or as a? I, I would. You could have played it. I don't know if it was a good deck per se, but it's definitely something that you, a lot of people might have played just because it's kind of dirty. Oh, what the heck? I was going to say mm -hmm. Snorlax, oh, well. but I Snorlax, guess that's no. not... No, it's not Snorlax. That's what, I was thinking Snorlax. I was thinking oh, Snorlax you were thinking Snorlax, too? too. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't, my, it wasn't my turn to guess, though, so... Mm -hmm. I guess we both, got, we both got a guess in, so we get our next hint. Yeah, so I got to provide y'all with the Pokédex entry here. Yeah, some of these Pokédex entries might make it a little too easy, so maybe you I'll skip that. You can give us the that. color. Yeah, it's a purple Pokémon. It is. It's purple. not Mewtwo, is it? No, that's nah, not six Mewtwo. Six, that's Mewtwo. six. No. Yeah, it's that's not that's Gengar six either. Not Gengar, no. And with that other hint I gave too, where you might have had your, you might have been looking out for this at Arlington Regionals. As a looking deck, out yeah. for a purple Pokemon. Pokemon. Well, I'll, I guess I'll give like another mini hint on top of that. The Pokemon that you might have been looking out for was not exactly purple, but it is kind of a similar type of thing. There's Frickin' no, yeah. purple. Purple. Uh, oh. Hmm. <laughs> What's the eye? What do you got? Is it wheezing? It is wheezing, yep. Uh, ah! It is wheezing. Uh, and that's why this weekend it wasn't purple because it's a Galarian. Galarian wheezing. Oh, ah, yeah. it's wheezing. Wow. Very clever. Very yeah. clever. Thanks, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised more people didn't play wheezing, but... It... Apparently, from what I heard, a lot of people actually were, like, asking for it at, like, the vendors and stuff. But oh, yeah. it's just such a <laughs> high roll deck. It definitely wins games, but it's also like I, I don't think it's like a legit good deck. But it is definitely a fun, like it, it's a pretty interesting deck that if you hit the right matchups right, I guess you could beat anything. Yeah, yeah. Poka X Word, the best place to get your fill of Pokemon inspired puzzles. New puzzles are posted every day, and they recently launched a new Guess That Pokemon puzzle, which is a ton of fun to play. Go check them out at pokaxword.com and be sure to follow them on Twitter for your chance to win a ton of PTCGO codes every month. Well, we can kind of move on here to our main topic, which is, of course, Pablo, Table Mine. I kind of want to, okay, so a very broad question, open-ended, of telling us more about yourself. But if you could squeeze in there where the name Table Mine came from. Oh, okay. So that's, that's I think actually... I know, but <laughs> so that's actually been the number one most asked question uh, since I created the the brand. 
And in my mind, it was so obvious and so easy because I, I, I think it's obvious like table like you're playing on a table with mons with pokemon no nah, right so i mean that's a good guess <laughs> but it's definitely not that so oh, yeah. <laughs> so my last name is mesa which mesa in spanish i mean mesa in english is table oh. so i was just combining my last name with pokemon and that's oh. how I got Tableman. But what, like, to me, it sounds very obvious, and I thought it would be very obvious. But I, like, afterwards, I realized that ninety nine percent of my viewers don't know the word in English, and like, mm. I sometimes get called Pedro, and I don't think a lot of people know my last name. So I think it was, uh, I don't know. Um, it was just something funny that, uh, that keeps on happening. Like I thought it was so obvious and so easy to decipher, but it's been the number one <laughs> most asked question since I started content creation, uh, mm -hmm. almost seven years ago now. <laughs> That's a pretty, pretty good, like pretty good name to have. I would say like a pretty, like a cool way to have your name connect to like your identity as a content creator. Right. I think that's I, really cool. I thought it was, yeah, I thought it was unique. And, mm -hmm. um, I also like that led to my, like, I've always been, I don't know, sort of creative. When I was a little kid, I always used to draw, like, all these different Pokemon that I wanted to be included in the game. Like, I was, well, I guess I still am obsessed with Pokemon. And um, and I was always, like, thinking of new Pokemon to design and draw and whatever. And so I was, like, it combined really well. Like, and yeah, I'll create a mascot for myself, and it'll be a Pokemon that looks like a table. And that led to yeah. um, everything that's happened up to this day. That silly little table with uh, uh, what's the name for the silly eyes? I forget. Oh, uh, the like the, the googly, googly eyes? eyes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, googly a eyes, table yeah. with googly eyes. I did not expect it to change my life so much. <laughs> when here we I are. Came up with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that explanation for like how you kind of got your like content creator names better than mine. Mine's literally just like a gamer tag I made when I first got an Xbox 360. <laughs> so. <laughs> But yeah, kind of going into that. Uh, so, what got you into playing Pokemon itself, and so, in the card game? So, like Pokemon itself, I as a kid before the internet, <laughs> I would <laughs> like get all my video game news from magazines. Yeah, there was one called uh, Nintendo Club, or in Spanish, Club Nintendo, uh, where they would publish articles and reviews about games coming out or that had come out in Japan and that were about to come out. And I've always been a gamer. I've always enjoyed. Uh, gaming and so at the time as well tamagotchis were a big thing i don't know if either of i you... remember those i remember those yeah yeah so I had a like squad there you go yeah i was like super hyped on tamagotchis and i loved them and i loved taking care of them and when i read the review of pokemon my understanding was that it was a tamagotchi that could fight other tamagotchis basically <laughs> so i was very excited about that um and that's how like i was really looking forward to the game I saw that it was released. I, I bought it for my Game Boy and I absolutely fell in love with the game. I bought uh, Blue initially and then I immediately I finished it and I bought Red so I could complete my Pokedex and everything. And I started reading all these theories about Mew and uh, how to get it and the mysterious Pokemon and Pika Blue and all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah Mew's under the truck. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I became so obsessed with Pokemon. And so every magazine that I bought, I would look for like, well, what else, right? When's the next game coming out or what else is happening? And that's when they uh, made a, an article about the trading card game that was big in Japan. And so uh, I waited and I set out to buy uh, some, Jap um, some Pokemon trading cards. And I found them uh, it, next to a bakery for some reason. See, yeah. Um, <clears throat> And like I got hooked, I, I had always loved collecting things and I would complete like the sticker albums of the World Cups and Dragon Ball and many other, anything that I that I could collect, I would essentially collect like the, the I don't know if you had them in the United States, but like we used to have uh, some like circular things that had the Pokemon inside chips. They were called mm. Tassos. They're like... <laughs> I don't know. That I feel like, yeah, that's not something. It was a really big thing here. Like you just, it's like a, a circular cardboard inside a bag of chips. Yeah. Mm. But like people would bet on them and like you would stack them up and like with the Pokeball on top. And then you would have to hit them with another one of those circular things called Tassos. 
and then um, you would try to flip them over, and if you flipped over both, then you would win the ones that you flipped over. And then, like, it got to a point where they got banned from schools and stuff because people were, <laughs> like, basically doing, like, betting rings over, <laughs> over the goal. Like, it got really hardcore. Um, and obviously, kids would get upset when they lost. And then <laughs> um, I remember I would buy, like, 10 bags of chips, and I didn't even like chips that much. I've never been too big of a fan, but I would just buy them for the for the thing, and then I would just hide them under the sofa so my mom wouldn't <laughs> see and stuff like that. So I was into very much collecting anything and everything, especially Pokemon. And so I started collecting the cards, and then eventually I got curious, like, well, there's text on this, right? I would like to know how to play them. And so I bought a starter deck, the first edition Match M starter deck uh, from all the way back, and I uh, read the booklet, and immediately, like, I've always been very competitive, and my immediate thought was like, okay, now I know how to play. Who do I play against? Right, mm -hmm. and my parents were never interested in in like learning or wanting to play the the cards, so I started asking, well, where do people gather? Like, where do I find other people to play? And that's how I found my my first league, where I brought my thirty water Pokemon, thirty water energy deck for the first time, <laughs> and of course, I got my butt kicked <laughs> at the <laughs> tournament. That's like such a pure story. That's it's, it is. That's it one is. of the best starting Pokemon stories I've ever heard. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's such a good you're like yeah started like a like a giant like betting circle in school <laughs> <laughs> basically yeah yeah went from yeah, gambling that's, that's to... cool though that's yeah. so cool yeah 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 i was like i don't know when i first found out about pokemon i was nine maybe 10 years old mm -hmm. i believe so it's been and i'm 34 now so it's been a while so then what was your transition into making the pokemon content like where where was that kind of journey headed to where you're like hmm, this is something I could do? Okay, so um, like the the really long version of this is I used to play um, StarCraft and Star well StarCraft Two, uh, which is a an RT a real time strategy game with Kyle Sukovich, Puka, mm -hmm. and Michael Pramowat and uh, Josue Rojano, um, Krim from the casting as well. And uh, we would get together and play and we would watch uh, broadcasts and videos and like everything related to StarCraft, which was essentially like the first eSport, I want to say. Yeah, that's what like caught everything started. And then, and that started in South Korea. And then it started getting more attention and especially when StarCraft 2 came out. And we would watch um, to, to people tasteless and our toes is their, are their, their tags um, cast. And I believe that's where Kyle got the inspiration to start um, the Top Cut, or what was the name? Yeah, of it was Top channel? Cut. Yeah, the Top, the yeah, top, top Cut. Cut. One, yeah, yeah. And so that's how this, he started creating content, and he he wanted to do live streams for Pokemon like they had for StarCraft. Yeah, I believe that was the initial inspiration. So that was like my first uh, initial uh, connection with content creation, but. Me being in Mexico, was the um, source. Then being, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but me being in Mexico and then being in the United States, and at the time, like traveling for regionals and stuff was not a thing like it is today. And I also didn't have the a job and a disposable income that I have today to be able to to do that. So it was hard to justify traveling to to regionals. You know, there wasn't this big incentives and travel awards and everything that there is today. So they were doing their thing, and obviously Kyle did a really good thing, and they started casting worlds, and it became a big thing, and now he works for Pokemon and everything. Um, and so there was one point around 2014 and 2015 where I got, especially 2014, I got very far away from, from Pokemon. I wasn't competing as much because I, I had a job that uh, sent me to live in Brazil, and so I missed... They sent me to live like a week after Brazilian Nationals happened, and on the weekend that Mexico Nationals happened. So I wasn't able to qualify for Worlds. Mm -hmm. Even if I had, I wouldn't have been able to go because I was like very far away. And uh, the Soccer World Cup was happening. I was a little bit more interested in that at the time since I was in Brazil when it was happening. And so that led to uh, me watching a lot of, of content, uh, something that I didn't do before, especially when Kyle stopped doing right. uh, Top Cut. I, I stopped watching, but at that point, since I wasn't able to play, I started watching more. And what I noticed from the content that was available at the time was that me being very competitive, you know, the content available at the time was more casual and very casual. Or uh, something like people would showcase these strategies, um, but something that 
I try not to do is like they, they probably played like 10 games and then they won one and that's the one they showed, right? But they wouldn't show <laughs> the other nine where the strategy doesn't work that well or doesn't mm -hmm. uh, do what it's supposed to do or isn't consistent enough or something like that, yeah? So yep. as a competitive player looking for competitive content, it wasn't like I wasn't really enjoying the content that much. And I actually started watching way more VGC than, than TCG at that point. And so... Um, Afterwards, I came back from Brazil. Um, I had a ex-girlfriend at the time that uh, also didn't like that I played Pokemon and silly me uh, <laughs> uh, stopped playing a little bit because of her as well. But then eventually we broke up. And when we broke up, that's when I started Tableman. Like I clearly was repressing a little bit. Nice, <laughs> I love nice. my Pokemon, right? <laughs> and so I started the channel with the goal of appealing to the competitive crowd, right? Like yeah. if someone wanted to get better at the game and wanted to learn um from someone that was also very competitive and um having gotten decent results like i've had in my career that's what i wanted to try to show yeah like appeal to the more okay i enjoy playing pokemon but if i'm interested in being getting better and practicing know. better and knowing what goes through the mind of someone that's been um <clears throat> doing well throughout the years um what what does it take or what goes through their minds yeah that's right. what i wanted to see that wasn't available so that's what i figured i'd start to to offer and if you watch like the very first few videos of my channel i look super awkward i don't know where i'm looking at i'm talking very like low and it's just like all over the place and i was like i was unfamiliar with uh any software i would record mm -hmm. myself with my iphone and i would edit my videos in after effects which made absolutely no sense and made <laughs> like the files 10 gigabyte files for a 30 minute video like i was not very very efficient but that's how i got started and of course i started to learn more and more and more um as time went on yeah and that's how i started content creation <laughs> yeah I, I would say you were maybe one of the first like uh i mean we had puka obviously but you were one of the first mm -hmm. like big like pro players who got like into content creation and were more focused on the the competitive side of things like puka was obviously really good at the game he was one of the best players but you know he had a lot of his like fun side series yeah me like, monday know, and funny yeah. friday and things like yeah. that yeah and, and that then, was like pure competitive, competitive tournament results decks tournament results decks yeah yeah because like yeah at the time you know the the big youtubers we had like you know dark integral gaming was getting big yellow swallow was mm -hmm huge i know like omnipoke i think was starting to upload at that time mm -hmm. he had like team fish knuckles but a lot of the yeah. he you know heavy hitters we have now like mahone azul and stuff they were making content at the time and you definitely i would say were one of the first like big players who really got into youtube and mainly just focused strictly on like the competitive side of stuff you were kind of like the the grandfather of all that i would say you know what i mean yeah that that's what i was trying to do like trying to use my curriculum from uh pokemon up until that point to make to give that to or to make that be my differential right because yep. i feel like right now especially now everyone's making content everyone like we're all uh battling out for uh the attention right the, yeah. the very limited attention and the very limited time that we all have throughout the day you have to make something of value and you have to really not just be one more of the bunch right so I feel like the more genuine you are with what you do and how you approach things, the better. And that's that's what I wanted to to be my differential, right? I didn't want to just create deck profiles or talk about Pokemon decks. I wanted to make it like a the best possible resource for any sort of competitive player or or aspiring competitive player to know what it takes to like compete at the very, very top. Yeah, and you can always like tell when, you know, people are making these videos because they think it's going to get views or they think, you know, that's what people want to hear or see. And you can always see the difference in the people who are doing it to do it versus the people who enjoy making the content that they make. Mm -hmm. Like LDF's a great example. Like he doesn't mm -hmm. like covering the meta decks because there's a million channels that cover the meta right, decks. Exactly. So, yeah. so LDF goes and creates these like insane cleaver <laughs> like cheese but like cheese that you know works <laughs> and it's yeah, just it, that's something fun you can tell decks, yeah yeah and like you can tell that you enjoy making those videos you enjoy making that content and i feel like at the end of the day that's just kind of what you need to do really is follow through with that and i'm kind of blown away right now i don't know if people mm -hmm. listening are on the same page with me but that's just that's just such an incredible startup story and especially mm -hmm. how you're how you got into content creation Thank um you. where where did that 
I guess, I, sorry guys, I just want to know more about the casting because I think this is mm-hmm. just so interesting because you've been playing for so long. So ha- was this an opportunity that was ever presented to you before or is it something that they just, I, I just want to know all of it. <laughs> so, um, like I had been asked to cast uh, tournaments before and actually there were a couple of instances that um, during when we started like this modern era of Pokemon and grassroots streamers were covering events and whatnot, like there were events where a couple of the casters just had early flights, right? And they couldn't cover the finals or quarterfinals or top eight or anything. And so I just so happened to be at a couple of those regionals and I was asked to fill in because I didn't make top eight. So I ended up casting top eight at like a Fort Wayne regional, I believe. Um, Team Fish Knuckles rem- reminded me of that one. I, I knew I had casted one, but I've played so many regionals I, that sometimes it just blurs everything. Yeah. Um, but it was that one. And then I do remember Hartford. That that was, uh, I casted with Cora. I don't know if either of you remember Cora Gregorio. I think that's her last name who now works for uh, Blizzard and develops Hearthstone, Hearthstone sets. But at that point, after that tournament, she got a casting gig with, with Pokemon, like a fixed casting. She was one of the main casters of Pokemon. Um, I was never asked. And I probably at that point, I was so hardcore into competitive, uh, which I still am, but definitely like one or two lines less because of the pandemic or since the pandemic. Um, but yeah, like officially, by Pokemon, I had never been been asked before to do it. I had been asked to cast grassroots streams. I had been asked to get make guest appearances, and I offered like I did that uh, at those two regionals um, just to help out um, with no expectation of like that actually pushing forward. But when Pokemon asked me if I had done it before and if I had any like sort of references, I used um, I mentioned that first tournament that I didn't remember. And the VODs, I think, are lost in the Twitch verse or something. Like, I, I couldn't even find them if I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, but I did have the hard for the hard for regionals videos available. Mm-hmm. And I did mention that, well, that's the tournament that set up Cora up. So probably, like, I might have been a part of that um, a little bit. And um, I got really good feedback mm-hmm. after that tournament as well, just like I got from LAC. And I also... Like I believe, like right before the pandemic, I organized my own invitational, trying to do like something different, uh, where I showed both players' cameras, which no one had done, or both players' hands at the same time, which no no one had done before, and now it feels like, or at least for players' cup, that was the standard and stuff. Um, and I used that as reference, and I casted that with uh, Joe. Um, later, I asked him if he, or rather, later he asked me. Or he was surprised that I was casting, so I figured they didn't ask him for any references. But that that was how um, it started, and yeah, I I had never been asked to do it officially before this LAIC time, and I think it played well. I think it it played in my favor, or probably I don't know, but I'm guessing because it wasn't Thanksgiving weekend, maybe that made some of the casters uh, not be as readily available as other weekends. And I'm from Mexico and we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. So that was never going to be a problem for me. And I'm from Latin America, right? And it was a Latin America International okay. Championship. So it was a nice, I don't know if that factored in, but maybe it did. Um, it was a nice, a nice bonus to have to be that, to have that be my debut as well. Felt extra special. <laughs> yeah. You got a lot of good feedback too. Like a lot of people really liked your uh, commentary mm-hmm. at LAIC. So I would say it was definitely very successful. And yeah, like you said, you know, to be a caster, you do have to have like a resume. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure if Pokemon are like they when they reach out to you, they'll like ask like what videos like or like what what you have on your resume. Right. And like for me personally, you know, I've done plenty of casting before. I've helped Hegster cast his like Hegster tourneys back when he did those. I've casted the uh, GG tour tournaments uh, with Azul and Pedro tours a couple times and I've done my fair share of casting, so I, you know, one day, like, I'm hoping one day, you know, maybe I could also, like, cast a tournament, you know, because obviously, like, I'm, I don't know if I'd ever, I am, like, I would consider myself a a decent enough player, but I don't think I'm, like, on that level where I'm, like, every tournament I'm going to start making top eight and stuff, and I wouldn't be available to, like, cast, so that is kind of cool to kind of kind of hear the inner workings of all that, and uh, so, like, I guess more about your cast experience at LAIC, so it was obviously, like, really good, and I noticed the production quality, too, at LAIC specifically was a lot higher than it was for like most of the other regionals. I know they do like a better job with the quality with like the ICs and stuff, but yeah, I noticed it was like 
pretty high quality, you know? Yeah, the stage, the stage when I first looked, I got a first look at the stage before mm -hmm. um, the players and stuff, and I was definitely amazed by by that. And it was cool. It was funny to see that <laughs> since the World Cup was happening yeah. um, in the big in the big um, TVs, they had the the Brazil match at the time, so that was <laughs> cool to to see. But yeah, I was also blown away by by everything that went uh, into it. Like I know it sounds super cliche, but like. It's it's true. Like I, as a player, now that I've watched uh, Pokemon streams, I definitely realized that there's a lot more happening um, ra than just like sitting down and talking about the game, right? Yeah. Um, but especially like all the effort that everyone puts in, but also like the effort required. It's not just about talking. Like you have the director talking to you um, in the in the headset. And then you have to be like very aware of even like where you're aligned within the the set, yeah, mm -hmm. where you're sitting. So there was definitely a lot of like intricacies and things that I was not expecting um, that I felt like I was able to adapt to quickly. Um, but it was also like very, it was way more demanding than I expected it to be. And by the end, I was like completely drained, uh, especially mentally after seeing and analyzing so much pokemon because like usually when i like when i'm playing i'm super focused on playing right and i get tired of playing or when i'm watching a stream it's like i have it open and then i get distracted and then oh yeah oh this is oh, okay cool and then oh, i pay attention so and then true. i go back mm -hmm. so then but like knowing and being ex ex extra aware right it was my first time like i felt like that added a little bit of extra pressure it yeah. was an ic not a regional right which is like more pressure in that like more prestigiousness in that regard so it was like layer and layer and layer and i was also i really wanted to be very aware of not saying something silly or something yeah, prohibited or anything like that. that yeah yeah and um i feel like less so than many other people because i've been very privileged in my life but also like spanish is my mother tongue right not english so it was like a, a little bit extra of having to really focus on making sure everything i said was clear and concise and uh, whatever accent I have or not um, wasn't something that would stop someone from understanding what I was saying or things like that. So it was definitely like I, in the beginning, I, I think you could tell I was in my head a lot of making sure that I was doing things right. But eventually when I relaxed into it and I was able to like go with it and Kyle was like, I can't give Kyle um, enough props. Like he was an outstanding uh, caster, uh, helpful and so were chip and freya but like since i was interacting with kyle all the time yeah like he he had my back the whole way through you know, yeah along kyle's with everyone a, else kyle's involved, a great but caster. kyle was incredible yeah yeah i mean i knew that there was a lot to go into it of course mentally it, like exact like you nailed it on the head for me i i have gotten exhausted from watching Pokemon streams just like trying to keep up with everything and like absorbing all the information and like I'm not even the one doing the analyzing like I'm just listening to it and that sometimes alone can be mentally exhausting enough so just hearing like like I, I knew that that work would be put into it of course but just hearing you say it now like I'm like oh like th they actually have to be the ones to say everything correctly and you know do that hard work for us on top of, you know, being entertaining on top of like dealing with like, you know, people talking in your ears and on top of it being your, you know, like you said, the inner Nats in your first debut on top of not even speaking like your <laughs> like the first language, like it's your second English is your second language, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I like it's that's, that is so many layers on top of layers <laughs> that. Wow. Yeah. It's really yeah. interesting stuff. Very yeah, it, it generally was. Uh, I definitely enjoyed it a lot more as well than I than I thought it would. Being how I've been like super competitive all my all my life, right, all my <laughs> Pokemon career. But I I generally like really thoroughly enjoy doing it, and I'm really hoping they'll they'll call me to do it again at some point. Yeah, hope hopefully, because yeah, like I said, you got really good feedback from the community. A lot of people really really thought you're a good caster. You know, being a, a good like pro player. You were, it was easier for you to kind of analyze a lot of the plays. And also, you've been playing for so long, you have a very good history and uh, knowledge of the game itself, which can add to the flavor of what you're talking about while you're casting. 
yeah, I, I definitely could tell that, um, like there were definitely things working in my favor, mm -hmm. um, such as like, yeah, the long years that I've been, that I've been playing a lot for like in the dead time parts, uh, where like we would literally be asked to like, okay, we need some time. So, um, just chat amongst yourself. And then Kyle also being, uh, a long time player led to some cool, uh, interactions and then, um, I, I do believe that obviously content creation has been a big help, like being comfortable yeah. in front of the camera. That's something that they said, like, yeah, we usually like, like, um, starting people off at regionals, right. But you seem to be comfortable enough with the camera that we think you'll be fine at an, at an international, which felt very nice, but also added that little bit of extra pressure, right? Like they're holding me to a really high standard from, from the beginning. And I think coaching, I think coaching also like really helped me um i don't know bring that analysis right because when i'm coaching that's what i'm doing right i'm analyzing and going through the motions and going through the little intricacies and scenarios of every little possible thing or uh, try to go through every little possible thing that could happen or lines of play that you could get so like like i said like when when i relaxed i was like okay like i've been coaching now for five years i've been making videos for seven years right and they're just asking me to be myself. So I just need to like trust that what I'm saying, as long as it's making sense, right, <laughs> will be appealing to to people. And I think that was the the result. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think that the the fact that you've made content for so long, you're used to kind of explaining things, sitting in front of a camera, explaining plays and even like playing live too. It can be something that a lot of people could find difficult is when you're when you're recording a video live or even streaming sometimes, it can be hard to kind of keep up with chat or try to talk right. while you're playing, you know, because you're so focused on the game. You want to make sure you're not misplaying and being in the commentary side of things, too, that can add to that. Well, you know, when you're making a video, you got to be so focused on the game, but also you got to be entertaining. And it can be the same thing when you're, you know, watching and commentating a game. You, you're focused on the game and you're thinking about these players' decisions, but you also have to be entertaining and it makes right. sure you know what you're saying is making sense, like you said. Yeah. And I think another another layer that I was uh, I knew would be present, but also uh, Cal made so easy is that I also needed to make sure that I was saying things coherent with what Cal was saying, right? Right. I couldn't just like he could say something and then be completely switch subject or talk like there had to be fluidity, right? And that's something that came naturally uh, for us, I think, since the beginning. But it's definitely something that we had zero practice on before the event, right? Like well, as soon as we sat down to cast round three, that was the first time that we were about to talk about a Pokemon game uh, together. So that also um, that also wasn't interesting to see how it flowed. But yeah, it added to that like uh, difficulty in the sense that you have to be paying attention to the game and the analyst, which was uh, my role at the time, um, has like an extra view of the of the game like a little bit more amplified than what you see on stream but like you have to be paying attention to that and also paying attention to what your uh to what your caster is saying That's right and as as the weekend went by it definitely became a little more difficult to a point where i i called him uh his brother's name <laughs> i felt very <laughs> silly for doing that that was completely out of exhaustion i knew who he was right but it was just it was it was a long a long three days <laughs> yeah no i yeah. think the first time i think the first time i met kyle at NEIC, I think I accidentally called him Ryan because, again, <laughs> I was, like, so tired after a long day. I was like, oh, I used to watch you and uh, Kyle's videos all the time. So. He's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good for you, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I called him Ryan. I'm like, whoops. Oops, yeah. Touching on the, like, how the fact that you guys had never sat down and, and talked about that stuff before you did the actual casting, I kind of went – to know about the preparation process like how long did you have from the moment you accepted like the moment you 100 percent were going to do it versus the time that it happened like how, how much preparation did you have okay so i had like since i was asked i had about a month mm. um to where like i hadn't yet signed the contract but it was pretty like established that um unless something out of uh, my control happened, I was going to be casting LAC. We just needed to figure out like the intricacies of the contract and everything and the NDA and everything. But, yeah. um, but it was about a month. Yeah. Mm. So with that month, um, like we were chatting, like we all knew who was casting. We couldn't reveal it to the public. 
And it got really awkward sometimes for me uh, because everyone just assumed I was playing, right? So like yeah. I'd have people, they revealed it like the Monday before. So I had people on Sunday before I see asking me, dude, how do you not know what you're going to play? Or like, what, <laughs> like, what are your thoughts? Or like, what are you like? And I couldn't say anything. Um, but yeah, like I had about a month. So during that month, um, I definitely started making myself more aware of like the Japanese metagame, uh, Lugia cards, which is something I would normally do um, for my normal tournament preparation. Uh, but for example, I made extra emphasis to learn attack names and ability names, because that's something that usually like, I know what they do, but especially in Mexico, we have the bad habit of, uh, well, bad habit because like the cards are in English or most of the cards that we play with are in English and many players don't speak English, right? So they can't right. pronounce or they, if you say the attack name, they will not necessarily understand what you're doing. So we just say, okay, I attack, right? And it's implied that the other person knows uh, which attack or if there's any confusion, you say, yeah, the first attack. But barely anyone uses the attack names or the abilities to signify what they're doing. They'll say Archib's ability rather than Primal Turbo yeah, to, to clear out. So that's something that after 20 years of playing in Mexico, I'm not used to saying the abilities. I've made uh, extra emphasis since I started traveling a lot more, but I sometimes get lax about it. But I knew that for this event... I needed to make sure that, that to the best of my ability, I knew especially the playable and important cards, right? So like Regigate, I I found out, I played Regis at Worlds and I would just say, like I would just say point and then grab, I wouldn't say anything. I would just point at the attack and grab my deck and people knew I was doing Regigate, right? But I just never said Regigate until LAIC. Mm -hmm. So those little things are were a little bit of extra preparation that I did that I wouldn't normally do, which is learning attack names and ability names. Yeah, that's that's yeah. actually kind of interesting to think about. You gotta you got when you're when you're casting, you have to say the attack or the ability name. You can't just say, Oh, no. Stoutland's using its first attack on Comfy. You have to say Stoutland's doing, you know, double dip fangs on Comfy. Double dip fangs, yeah. Which exactly. is yeah, that, and then that's usually very like know know the attacks to it, like well, oh, so like if this attack, you know, knocks out a basic Pokemon, then like you like so it's <laughs> Not only the attack names, but kind of more of the specifics with it too. And like, right. I, I don't know if it was there. Do you felt like there was a time where you it was like a very weird ruling situation? Uh, I not rulings, but I like if you if any of you went back and watched uh, rewatched the casting, you would be able to note many times where I wasn't a hundred percent aware or didn't remember exactly the name of the attack because it's so many different attacks and so many yeah. different abilities, right, right? Yeah, yeah. so i did say sometimes uh <laughs> oh yeah they're using their first attack to do blah 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 right yeah. so like that's the important part right what the attack does but it I in here and there you know, yeah just, exactly yeah. so so it was like a little bit uh like trying to dissimulate dissimulate no so trying to like um what's the word i can't speak english now anymore it's uh, <laughs> trying to ma not make apparent that I didn't remember the attack name because that's yeah. something that like they say okay like please try to use the attack names and the uh, abilities as much as you can right but it's also impossible to remember every single card. Yeah, yeah well exactly. especially if someone's on stream playing something that's kind of like weird like a rogue right. deck right that's where it becomes even yeah harder. exactly yeah you know? and that's where the the card that shows up in the in the cast also helps. Mm. Yeah, that's also cool too. Like sometimes that will bail you out essentially that's true. Oh, into yeah, okay. what, yeah. <laughs> what the card name. Yeah, it's like, oh yeah, they're about to use uh, Primal Turbo. Yeah, yeah Primal Turbo and they're going <laughs> to, yeah. So like I knew everything that the cards did. I just sometimes the names slip by or and like talking and analyzing and everything. Some things just, just end up. And being live, it. there's going to be mistakes. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, I had to get out of that habit um, pretty quickly for my first regional because my <laughs> locals, um, we, you know, we would kind of, you know, we're just playing, you know, and like we kind of just be like to signify the attack. So like those yeah, aren't exactly. watching. It's, I'm literally just like, like flinging my hand, like just, just flinging <laughs> it like, okay. And then like you just put, we just like knew. And yeah. then I would, I was definitely one where like, uh, Sinchino or like oh Greninja like I'll just say the Pokemon instead of um, the actual ability name but ability, I knew that that was yeah. something that I needed to work on yeah. going into yeah. my region that way there's just no confusion avoiding all the 
Yeah, when exactly. Scandals, the, the, clear, and... the clearer you are, whether it's casting or playing, the better, right? Yeah, so, when, so it yeah. makes sense. When I was on stream, they said that you, you have to pronounce everything you do. So if you're going to play like Lost Zone, you know, you have to be like, all right, flower select, and then, you know, I'll go conceal cards. You have to, you have to announce everything you do, like, while you're, while you're, uh, like, playing on stream in the headset when you're, you know, with the other player. And that was something that I was like, oh, I didn't know yet. Like, that's interesting. And that's something that I had to, you know, get into the habit of really quickly in my yeah, match I did with Grant. Yeah, don't see their right? mouths to, on the stream. Yeah, <laughs> like, you don't know that, you know, watching stream that you have to say every attack. But, yeah, even when you're streaming, right, you have to make sure uh, you're on stream. You're going, like, okay, I'm doing, uh, read the wind or primal turbo one and then primal turbo two. Because I, I don't do that when I play two, right? I'm like, all right. I'm going to use Lugi's ability, or I won't even say anything. I'll just flip over the V-Star marker and put Archaeops in play type of thing, you know? So, yeah, of course. Very interesting. Yeah. I guess that's something we got to get better at in the habit of doing is reading mm-hmm. attack names and ability names so that it yeah. becomes more easier for us when situations like this do pop up. Yeah, right. That's a fair point. Something new. Do you yeah. feel like you put a lot of, I, I don't know if like research is the right word, but like a lot of research into the players as well, just to like make sure that, you can kind of touch on any achievements that somebody might have. Yeah, like you felt thing. like yeah. you knew anybody who walked up on the stage. Uh, so I do feel like because of I've been playing for so long, um, like especially the normal names, I'm aware of their stories. They're like I've watched them do well or everything. Um, from names I didn't recognize, definitely worth it to like check on Limitless, check on like see if there's a little bit of history or any um any potential like storyline that you can play into um i was definitely trying to advocate a little bit towards the latin america players and to yeah. have like that vari- variety of uh nationalities in the stream um because i feel like sometimes latin america uh is viewed as like oh it's brazil and some others right but latin america is 20 different countries right and we had mm-hmm. a lot of different countries represented so there was one point where some players were saying like well we haven't had many latin american players um on the stream when the previous two rounds had been had featured a mexican player and a chilean player so it was more like oh well it's actually uh brazilian players that wanted more brazilian players which is understandable right and they are the majority at the event but i was trying to like emphasize as much as possible um, the variety of Latin America representation. Yeah. That's very so, important. Yeah, yeah, very important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've thought of that too because you had a when when you're casting, you have to know like these players' achievements. It's a bit easier with someone like Tord, right? Where it's like, oh yeah, he's got right. all four ICs under his belt. He's won <laughs> Peoria and all these regionals. But yeah, I guess some like some of the players that maybe you might might not know as much. You kind of have to have that knowledge. Is how have they done and how they placed before? So. Yeah. yeah, and of course, Limitless is a is a great resource for that. But it's also nice to have an underdog story, right? Like someone yeah. who this is their first tournament and they're running really well and they're doing really well. And that's that's it. I think that at least for me that I've been playing for so long, like when we got internationals for the first time, it felt like it opened up the possibilities of so many players that it was either worlds or nothing, right? Like that was it. But now it's like we have four mini worlds uh before worlds yeah. so i definitely think that's led to a lot of new and upcoming players to uh get opportunities to showcase their their skill right yeah plus yeah. like the pandemic opened up that unique little right. time of the online era where there was just the online events and a lot of people joined the game <laughs> so i always thought that was kind of interesting too is that we're going to start seeing those people come up where it's like oh it's this is a covid ptcgo starter and yeah. you know here they are <laughs> so definitely some interesting stuff so yeah i think that will conclude today's episode on the shuffle pod here the episode with pablo of course pretty good discussion uh talking a lot about uh commentating casting and what goes into that the little you know little fine details and everything definitely a really good discussion to be had there and of course pablo had a very cool come up story within the pokemon community it was awesome to hear that and uh if you want to kind of the floor is yours pablo to kind of promote anything your socials or whatever the floor is yours i mean everything's under the table and brand uh twitter you well youtube is where i'm most active of course but twitter facebook instagram twitch um i don't stream very often but hopefully it's good when i do yeah um <laughs> yeah that's about it oh and metafy if you're looking for a little bit of coaching. Um, I do have 
openings for San Diego and the rest of the season. So in case you're looking into that. And we'll put those in the link down below. So make sure you guys check that out as well. But any final thoughts, LDF? No, I think uh, I think today's episode was pretty pretty good. And uh, yeah, I think that'll be it for us tonight. And I will catch you all on the next episode. All right, peace out, everybody. Ciao. The Shuffle Squad is proudly sponsored by Atlas Collectibles, the best place to buy any trading card game product online. Visit atlastcg.com and at the checkout screen, make sure to use code TSS12 to save an unbeatable 12% off your entire order. Atlas Collectibles will ship your product anywhere in the world, so make sure you're taking advantage of the 12% savings with TSS12. And if Pokemon is not your thing, don't worry. Go to atlastcg.com and see all the other amazing trading card game products they have there to offer. The Shuffle Squad has partnered with PTCGO Store to provide our community with the best access to Pokemon TCG codes. They have codes available 24 seven, instant email delivery, and you can save 5% off by using code TSS5. If you're a YouTube member or Patreon supporter, you'll have access to a special code that gets you 10% off. So what are you waiting for? Use code TSS5 today and save 5% on your next order of codes on any codes available at ptcgostore.com. Poka X Word, the best place to get your fill of Pokemon inspired puzzles. New puzzles are posted every day and they recently launched a new Guess That Pokemon puzzle, which is a ton of fun to play. Go check them out at pokaxword.com and be sure to follow them on Twitter for your chance to win a ton of PTCGO codes every month. Check out the Late Night Series Season 6, brought to you by myself, Zach Lesage, and the Shovel Squad. We're going to be running a bunch of sick events for the Pokemon community, and they start on August 30th. So one thing you might be noticing here is that there's an EU time and an NA time. We have one at 12 p.m. Eastern, which works out to about 5 p.m. in London. And then we have one at 7 p.m. Eastern, which should help out a lot of players on the West Coast play in this event. That being said, we still have a lot of cool things going on. Expect similar prizing that we've had for other late night series events. Expect better staffing, except expect better tournament experiences. And of course, we do have a stream going up for this season as well, and I will be streaming the event on Twitch. That being said, we have the whole season up on the Play Limitless website. Late Night 51 all the way through 70 runs until we hit the, reg the Invitational on November 5th. So check that out, sign up today, and support Zach Lesage Events and the Shuffle Squad. See you there.